We fight to be seen without compromise. What is this thing, female? It's more than hair and makeup. A light goes off and you just fail finally. I know what I need to do to feel complete and be happy. I don't think that gender is fixed. I don't need your acceptance, I just need your respect. My mother put her hand on my shoulder and looked me in the eye. You know you're a girl, right? Ooh, the bathroom. What do we do about the bathroom? Just bathrooms. Y'all gotta use them. You're a beautiful human being. I accept you for who you are. I was trying to make it through without transitioning, and I couldn't. Testosterone is a powerful hormone. That dude's awesome at his job. That dude's a chick. We live in a world that tells so many people that they're not enough. I'm here to tell you that you are. Janet, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Congratulations on this documentary. It's, it's beautiful. It's wonderful to see these stories told in their own words. It's a series of portraits, but it's mostly about listening and uh, listening. That's what it feels like the documentary is about. Oh, well, thank you so much, Ricky. Um, what I love so much about it is that it's just trans folks talking, giving testimony about their experiences, about their lives, about the things that they've applauded through and the things that they've cried about. And I love that there's no kind of uh, middleman in between. It's just them and the camera, then the audience. You were the middle person in between. You were doing all the interviews, right? But I love that no one sees me, you know? Like, that I'm not in the way asking my questions. I ask my questions off camera. Or it's really interesting the way that the List series, Timothy Greenfield Sanders List series, he's done the Black List, the Out List, the Latino List. And in those films, in the actual camera, my face as the interviewer is in the camera. And so the subject on camera is talking to me, like right to my face. Oh, the Errol Morris style. Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. So it's really fascinating that way. It kind of, it, it creates a sense of intimacy that allows people to not only hear someone, but I, I believe to, to really feel them. How did you go about choosing the subjects for the trans list? The hardest part of my job was the curation of who do we include in this vast and plentiful community? Um, as a trans person, of course, I was engaged in the sense of knowing who some of my heroes were, and also some of the people that um, I just knew through activist spaces, through media spaces. And so I came up with a list of 150 people. <laughs> and there's, there's what, what do you have here, 12? 11. 11. 11 people. Um, and so uh, the other list films have 16 folks in it. Um, ours has 11 because we wanted to give each person about five minutes each, a lot more space and breathing room to actually digest what they're saying because so much of um, what people say about trans folks is that they don't know trans people, right? And so what this film does so well is that it allows people to know now 11. And then with a the companion book, The Trans List, um, we have, an, I think uh, there's about 40 portraits in there with other folks' stories in it. But the biggest fights that we got with, with my fellow producers was around who do we include? And what was important for me to show was that um, the community is not a monolith that we have various experiences, that we are from different generations, we're different ages, we transitioned at different times in our lives, um, that our experience with wealth and economy and access to employment and education is vast and wide, and so that's why um, we fought so often that if we got someone to say yes, then that takes out another 10 or 15, because it's not that those people didn't have anything different to say, it's just that in this limited one hour film, we wanted to make sure that we painted as broad of a stroke of the trans experience as we could. Which I think is so important because so often the experiences that are portrayed in, in uh, mainstream media is such a horrible word to have to use now because it's taken on so many different meanings. But we'll, we'll necessarily say mass media is, are the sort of portraits that are sort of only palatable to a sort of middle America class. So it's like sort of really marginalizing even the more marginalized in the transgender community. And I love that with this documentary, it was, it was very broad, and you have someone like Buck Angel, who's a porn star, and he's very proud of being a porn star, and the documentary in that way is kind of celebrating his pride. Was there ever any talk about having to make the voices more palatable to like a, a, a mainstream America, middle America audience? Even though I will say middle America is made up of many different voices, but exactly. I think and my I, generalization is understood. No, of course. <laughs> and I think that oftentimes what, what, one of the questions we kept on asking ourselves is who is our audience, right? And yeah. because we had HBO documentaries as our partner from 
the start, we didn't really have to think so deeply about that because we know that they paint such a wide span of who who subscribes to HBO. And so for us, we weren't so worried about that. It was around the educational piece. How much 101 do we need to include in this film? And that's where I think that we had a lot of struggles because I wanted to make sure that we got beyond 101 and that when we were talking about these specific people's lives, that we're giving them space to talk beyond just the body and transition. And you bring up Buck Angel. And the reason why I wanted him in there specifically, or at least a someone engaged in sex work or in the porn industry, was because I wanted someone who could talk about the body in a way that was about centering the pleasure politic for that person. And what Buck does so well is that he's unapologetic about his body not necessarily fitting the way that society says his body should fit as a man, right? And so often when we talk about trans people, we just immediately talk about the parts of their bodies, what they've done with their bodies, and not so much what it means to exist in that body, in this culture that is oftentimes hostile or constantly questioning um, their experiences. I think that's so important that you talk about getting beyond 101 because for so often these stories have been defined by the coming out story, by the by the body, and what this is is like there is a, some of them tell a kind of coming out story at times, but the running theme isn't that, and the the film itself isn't fascinated with that story. Some tell it, and some don't. Was that important to you when it came to the interviews? Was it sort of like <laughs> if this comes up for them, let them talk about it, but this isn't that important for us to get out of them. Yeah, uh, for me, what was what was vital was that they were, first of all, was that they felt comfortable and safe enough to talk to me. And then the next level for me was, I, I sat with these people, each person, for at least two hours. They, Put it down only, to five minutes. You only yeah. did five minutes with them, right? And so a lot of them told their entire life stories to me. But we pulled out the themes from each person's story, then we tried to mix and match them, and that's where Joanna, our... Um, editor really came in. She was so smart and so kind um, and so gentle with the way that she pieced together themes for each person. Um, Amos Max, um, he he is a photographer um, and he started a zine for trans men and trans masculine people called OP Magazine. He talks about his obsession with boys and boy gangs and it's no, it's no um, coincidence that later on in his life he creates a zine that centers, you know, boyhood and masculinity and, and challenges challenging the notions of toxic masculinity. And so for me, it, was, it wasn't so much to shy away from the fact that, um, that trans people change their bodies or some don't or some have medical interventions and others doesn't. It wasn't so much about the idea of medical or social transition. It was more around um, the idea of saying that, yes, we've talked about trans bodies in this way since Christine Jorgensen got off of that plane in 1959, right? That we've done that already. And so let's move beyond that. I think that that's what I was constantly trying to try to push through the interviews was to talk about the things that they were passionate about and um, the things that, that really um, made them who they are, not just the trans experience. That's the, that's the thread, I think, this idea of wanting to be seen as how you see yourself, uncompromisingly, not, um, not with apology, um, just a sense of like, constant, I wanted to strip away the idea of the sense of having to legitimize our experiences. So when you worked your list down to the 11, 12, and including you, because you do appear at the beginning of the documentary, when you worked your way down the list, what were the sort of guiding factors? Was it how they told a whole story mm -hmm. together? Well, everyone that we interviewed, we used their, their footage, right? So we only interviewed 11 people. Um, and so for me, the guiding force was this piece of like, how do we paint this mosaic of this very vast, plural um, community? And so for me, a lot of that had to do with generation. I thought that that was important. So we have someone as young as um, someone who just graduated from high school, which was Nicole Maines. Um, and we have someone as old as Miss Major Griffin Gracie, one of the pioneers of the trans movement who was actually there at Stonewall and who's still very active as an activist. She's incredible. She is, she is a star. And I've always known that. She's, she's a mentor of mine. And she, before that, she was just a hero of mine. And to be able to sit down with her and to have on tape her talking about her entire life experience. And um, through this, and even before, as, as we were shooting the project, um, the translist, she was shooting her own documentary, which is out now. It's called Miss Major. 
Um, it's it's a beautiful it's a beautiful film done by two people who've been in um, who've been in coalition with her doing this work for for gender rights over the years. But for me, it was like generation, it was race, it was e e um, economics, it was all of the intersectional issues as a feminist that I that I care about. And so it was about not so much, and then also gender presentation. You know, um, creating a space um, so that someone as vibrant and full as Alok, who's in the film, um, so that they can tell their story. And they're the only person in our film that um, identifies as genderqueer, um, who's non-binary, who also goes with the singular they as their pronoun. And so it was vital for, for me to make sure that I created a space for that and also created a space where um, you know, trans masculine folk and trans feminine folk are just as present and none take over and that they're not more white folk than black folk or Latino folk. And so making sure that we were inclusive. Yeah, Trans trying to be as inclusive as we can in 60 minutes. Intentionally inclusive. Yes, I would say that that's that's what it is. Uh, she is she's so in, in, incredible. I already forgot her name. Excuse me. I, I, I Miss Major Griffin about, Gracie. Yes, mm -hmm. I really just learned about her through this documentary. And one thing that she says in her interview is that she feels like the trans community was on the front lines of the LGBT rights fight in 1969 at Stonewall. But for whatever reason, they are the last sort of uh, letter in the acronym. Uh, that defines sort of LGBTQ rights. Well, I guess they're second, second to last now, excuse me. And there's an element of what she says where she's somewhat bitter about that. You know, we were the first ones. How did you respond to that when, when, when you heard her say that? Because it is still this point where it does seem like the LGBT commu the LGB community has gained a certain amount of momentum and the trans community is unfortunately like just a little bit behind and, 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 and catching up at this point. And I think that you know I agree with her um, on so many so many sentiments, but specifically that when I think um, Bambi Salcedo in the film a trans Latina activist, she says the same thing. She says that it, we are forty years behind the gay movement, right? And the trans movement is, is forty years behind. And I believe that what Major is saying in the film when she says that the T needs to be in the front and all of you all need to move in the back is that this sense of like also rallying around this. Um, around the fact that it was poor people, it was street folk, it, it was it was street folk, it was trans youth, it was sex workers, it was people who were on the streets who put their bodies on the line that night at Stonewall and many other uprisings from the Compton Cafeteria riots. They've been the ones who've always been on the front lines, the ones who had nothing to lose but their lives, but their freedom. And for some reason, with the mainstreaming of the LGBT movement, gay cisgender folk were the ones who prioritized themselves and the things that they thought were important. And now we're at a time where, overwhelmingly, there's been so much progress for um, cisgender queer folk, but not so much for everyone else who lives these lives that are not just one part of the acronym, but also part of other marginalized groups, right? So we have Bambi Salcedo, a trans Latina who was incarcerated in part of her life before becoming like an activist, right? We have Miss Major Griffin Gracie, a black trans woman who's an elder, who's, um, who's a revolutionary, who's also been incarcerated. So all of these issues, they're a part of each person's story. But what happens is that when we create these coalitions, we tend to flatten. We flatten down the complexities of people's lived experiences in order to make ourselves, going back to the audience question, ourselves more palatable to, a, to an audience that is uninitiated to what our experiences are like. When you talk about making ourselves more palatable to an audience that's uninitiated, how do you feel, well, when in the wake of this recent election, all of the conversation has been, culturally, we've been moving too fast for this community, the white the straight cisgender white community that sort of voted for Donald Trump in the Rust Belt, if you will, that we were culturally moving too fast for them and this vote was a repudiation to sort of slow it down. How does that make you feel as a, as a trans woman of color that we're now sort of bending backwards for a group of people who progress essentially doesn't necessarily affect, like we're slowing down progress which affects the trans community, people of color community, but we're doing it for a group of people who are essentially entitled in this country in many ways. And I think that so much of what we're talking about too is this. So I had that question written down much better on my oh, card. Okay, did you? <laughs> well, it happens. Um, what's so interesting to me is a sense of, um, like talking about the way that oppression works, right? In this sense of like, you know, people talk about these problematic terms of like oppression Olympics, right? Who has it worse than other folk? And there's this whole idea of like identity politics is the reason why 
But then, you know, Trump ran on identity politics. If you think about it, he pointed out people's identities all the time in order to rally a base that wanted to, that no longer wanted to be able to hold their tongue, that they were angry that certain people seemed to have it better than they did, right? The fact that they were poor, they're like, well, I'm poor, so why are you okay with, you know, you're having all this progress, but still, overwhelmingly, their whiteness will enable them into, enable them come into spaces and have access to so many systemic things that shut, marginalize people down over and over again. So yes, we all have, you know, a lot of um, trans folk are poor, but they're also trans and they're also of color. There is um, interlayers there. There's layers to this stuff that I think that we need to talk through the grays and be, un be, uh, be comfortable being uncomfortable and not so much this idea of I can't talk about that or, or I can't say this and he's giving me now license to be able to say all of the ridiculous stuff that I want to say and not have to not say it, to be angry that I'm not taking my country back. I, I couldn't agree with you more and I think it's fascinating that identity, pol trans rights, LGBTQ rights have been lumped into this word identity politics mm -hmm. as if they weren't just people fighting for human rights. And yet the vote that was that happened in the Rust Belt community is not lumped into identity politics for some reason. It's econo it's economics. What do you think what do you associate that with? Well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't really have a I don't really have an answer um, to um, try to unpack, you know, white patriarchal capitalistic society. Uh, just did. Because I don't, you know, I don't necessarily have, you know, those um, pleasures or those access that um, some of those folk have, but I think that it's just this idea of that there's only so much and that if there's any kind of progress anywhere, it's taking away from me. Yeah. And I think that that's a wrong, uh, that's an incorrect way to look at this. You know, one of the self-evident truths, you know, that the founders had was that all men are created equal. Now we know at that time when they meant men, they meant white cisgender straight men. Right? They weren't talking about the rest of us. And I think that what was interesting and vital was that you know, Hillary Clinton's campaign was running on this sense of trying to widen that coalition, try to widen and say that we're going to center and prioritize folk who've not been centered and prioritized for so long in our politics. Um, and what happened was that half of the country did not vote for that America. Half of the country- A little said, less, what a little a, less than yeah. that, sorry. No, about, <laughs> about two million 40, less. 40, yeah. Was it 47%? 22.5 uh, 2 million less at, the, at this moment. There might be a little more at this point. Well, yeah, and so the sense that, that they were saying we're gonna take this country back and we want all men to be back to what we said all men was. When it comes to the new administration that's that's coming in, we'll, we'll, we'll get off the election in just a minute, but when it comes to the new administration- I have no more answers. <laughs> yeah, so. But uh, are you worried that at best, when it comes to trans rights, the new administration won't discuss it at all, and at worst, someone like Mike Pence, who's the vice president, will actively try to take rights away? We were just mentioned for the first time in a presidential speech just a couple years ago. And so trans, exactly. folk, trans folks specifically are not used to being mentioned, period. Um, one of the biggest things that happened in this last administration was in 2010 when Hillary Clinton's State Department um, passed um, regulations so that trans folk no longer had to have surgical intervention in order to have their passport gender markers changed. That was vital and important. What has happened now is that whole grassroots communities are raising money to ensure that trans folks can get access to that before it possibly gets changed. Because being able to have your gender marker changed on your identification enables you to not have to deal with discrimination when you're apl applying for a job or any kind of application, when you're trying to look for a home, all of these things, it, it, uh, it's, a, it's a layer of, um, it's one possible hurdle that's pushed away. Um, so for me, I think that my community, probably more than any other, is, and when I say my community, I largely mean trans and queer folk of color, our communities have long never been prioritized. And so we're not, you know, we're not surprised by this, um, this kind of vitriol. It's something that we deal with every single day. I think that what's happening now is that there are a lot more people being a lot more overt with their, with their vitriol and their hate and their harassment. Um, but we've been used to that kind of overt, um, policing, the overt um, exiling, the overt violence and harassment. You know, trans women of color 
Um, today is World AIDS Day, and trans women of color are an overwhelmingly vulnerable population when it comes to HIV AIDS, um, and they're also overwhelmingly vulnerable when it comes to violence. And so for my communities, what's happening now and what I've seen um, is that we have gathered together in ways to ensure that folk are taken care of. We're ensuring that we're raising money for grassroots organizations that are for and by and led by trans folk, and it's vital that we get the message out. We have two activists in here who have their own um, organizations. Miss Major Griffin Gracie, there's TGIJP out of the Bay Area, that's her organization, and we also have Bambi Salcedo, who's the Trans Latina Coalition, and so making sure that they have all of the resources, the talent, the time, and the skills necessary so that they're as strong as possible when we're dealing with these patchwork of laws that could be happening. One of the most beautiful things about the documentary is that it seems like every participant, every subject that is interviewed wants to, first and foremost, let trans youth know that they are not alone. I mean, I think even if, even if one of them doesn't bring it up in the documentary, I mean, it comes up enough where it seems like it's on everybody's mind and that's their first priority. Were you surprised by that, or did you know when you sat down with that, with with with, with this eleven these eleven subjects that that was probably going to be the first thing? I think it's just one of those things where it's my final question in every interview after two hours of talking to each other. You know, a subject is comfortable, and my final question for each person was, "What would you say to your younger self?" And I think that it ended up being the most poignant pieces for every single person there. Um, you know, Buck Angel has a moment in the film, and it's not necessarily a spoiler, but he breaks down when he talks about, you know, wanting to present in a way and telling that child that you can present in any way that you want to, and for him that way was G.I. Joe, right? That you can be G.I. Joe. Um, and so I think that there's just this reverence, and for a lot of the folk in this film, I think beyond maybe um, myself and Nicole um, Maines were able to transition as when we were young, you know, middle school, for her it was elementary, for me it was middle school. And so a lot of those, a lot of the people, our subjects in the film, weren't a part of a generation that had access to being able to transition as early as they wanted to. So I think that, that there's kind of a reverence for a lost youth in a way. And um, I think that that's where that kind of comes from, this sense of not so much that anyone wanted to change any part of their lives in the film, but I think there was a sense of um, wishing that they were a part of a time, a period, a place where it would have been okay to, to, to have been who they wanted to be. And there's still certain parts of the country where it's not a time or a place where it's okay to be who you want to be. Do you struggle with being able to have advice for those people since, as you said, you were, a, you were able to transition at such a young age? Do you have trouble sort of, I wouldn't say have trouble relating, but sort of being able to give authentic advice to someone like that? Um, I always, I'm always, I always have a weird um, relationship to adults asking other adults what they would, what advice they'd give to young people because I feel like young people will ask you if they wanted to know, right? <laughs> so it's like this ageist, bizarre thing that we do. So, so if I, they don't ask you, they don't want to know. They're, yeah, they're kids. exactly. Um, and so for me, I'm not so much worried about young people as much as I think that some people may be. And maybe it's because I, I was a young person and I figured it out, even though I had my own obstacles and challenges. Um, and so for me, no, it, it's, I don't, I, if a young person asks me, you know, there's one time, one of the greatest moments with the release of my first book um, was that a young woman walked up to me um, during uh, a Q&A of one of my book signings. And she was like, what advice would you give to a trans girl who's entering high school. And that was something that I could specifically give her as advice. And it was so affirming for me to be able to have this possible reader in my head that I was writing for and to have her show up and materialize and stand up and ask me a question um, about being trans, about being a girl, about being young. What did you uh, tell her, if you don't mind me asking? What did I tell her? Um, I told her to surround herself with with people who affirmed her and who nodded more than anything else, um, to ensure that you surrounded yourself with adults or um, peers who are able to advocate for you on days when it's hard for you to have to stand up and educate others um, or try to change other people's minds. You know, for me, when I was in um, the 10th grade, I had this social worker who was um, assigned to our school, and she went around, and she, um, my name wasn't legally changed at the time, and she ran around and, and to every single class um, that I was in and before I got there and talked to each teacher 
for me. And she told them that I was a trans girl coming in, that my name appears this way, but she goes by Janet, and this is her name, so ensure that you call her by that. To and she, you know, She kind of gave them all 101 lessons that made my road in the classroom that much easier. Um, enabled me to be able to, to show up and just do my work and not, have, um, not having to battle and do the work of having to talk to my teacher, getting my teacher to understand. Instead, a peer, a colleague of theirs, came up and did that work. And I think it's so vital that we surround um, young folk, especially those from marginalized communities, surround them with people that can do that work for them so that they can show up and just be young people. Absolutely. I'm going to open it up to the audience for questions. Who has a question? Right here. Hi, Janet. Um, I hope Hi. I can um, articulate this how I want it to. Um, I know like since when we start growing up as young people and even when we have peers, we're taught to love people how they are and you're beautiful inside and you know, you don't have to worry about like your outside appearance or changing yourself for anyone else. But I wanted to know like within a trans community, is it promoting the aspect of changing yourself or that like it's right or is there like, mentors around that are like mentoring them before they go into transition? Or is it something that, you know, they're saying, oh, I'm, I like myself the way I am? And what gets them to the point where they don't like the person that the skin that they're in? Um, I don't think that, you know, trans folk are, and I get this question a lot around this idea of changing one's body. And I think that we have to, just because for so long we've heard so much around the stories of folk who have adapted or shifted or changed their body, right? That has been the focus. But many trans folk don't want to change their body. It's just the narrative that has been overwhelmingly out there because oftentimes it's the most sensational and visual, visual that people can see the idea of like this before and after photo. Caitlyn Jenner actually talks about it. Um, very eloquently in the film around this idea of going from this, you know, hyper masculine idea of what is powerful in our country to going to this idea of a feminine person that is seen as not as strong, right? The way in which we internalize sexism and misogyny, right? Being a woman now. And then on top of that, being a trans woman and doing it all publicly. Um, I don't think that trans people are um, are not so much like I don't want them to be seen as beacons of anything. Like they're just people who are on their own journeys. And what I want to center in the work that I do is that all of us can do whatever we want with our bodies because they're our bodies. Whether that means that you need access to reproductive rights, whether that means that you want to shift and change your body in any kind of way that makes you comfortable. For me, what's most important is that folks center their own gaze and their own desires, not so much trying to appeal to an idea of what is beauty that's outside them, but what they think is beautiful. Absolutely. Um, next question. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, I was wondering, do you think there's kind of an art to interviewing? Like, were these people who you spoke with were very forthcoming, or did you kind of have to do some digging and develop some trust? Um, I think that there was, and it is really bizarre, but I think that that's why it's really important that we have folk that um, look like us doing, sometimes doing this work, or look like us or represent us in some kind of way, because it, it already creates a sense of um, intimacy that... It, because I, was a, because I am a trans person and I'm talking to trans folk about their experiences, not just about being trans, but just their life experiences, I think there was a sense of understanding and reflection that enabled me to, enabled me to talk to them and create a sense of comfort. Um, but anytime I interview anyone, it's just the idea of wanting to be prepared, knowing their life story, but not knowing too much so that I still have a curiosity and can, and can inject myself when necessary to get them to explain something further. Or The thing is, what's difficult about this particular film is that I'm not on camera, so you don't hear my questions. So I have to have them um, paint pictures and stories in ways that a lot of them are not storytellers if that makes sense. They're just people living their lives. And so it was difficult sometimes to get some of them to just draw that out and get them to come out and tell a story instead of just answering a question as a soundbite, which a lot of them are so used to because of being in media. They're like, I have five minutes. I have to do this quickly. But we're sitting here and talking for two hours. So just see me as someone that's here just listening to you. And then that way, the audience gets that. But is there an art to an interview? I think, I think there is. I think it's preparation. I think it's also listening. I think a lot of times, um, folk who do this work don't necessarily listen. They just ask the question, and then they move on. But sometimes the greatest things are the questions you don't have written 
written written down. It's the it comes in the listening in the in the um, in the little moments that someone may like have a random tangent and you just go with that tangent and you follow them. And so for me, my job was just to steer them in the in the direction of where they already have all this brilliance inside of them. Thank you. <laughs> Next question. Hi, over here. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> was there anything in the movie that you kind of wanted in, but you didn't know, you weren't sure if you should put it in or not? And while you were in those interviews, those long interviews for like hours and hours, was there anything that people were like, oh, maybe you shouldn't put that in? Maybe, you know, I don't, I'm not sure anymore uh, mm -hmm. if I'm sharing too much now or what? There is a moment during Bambi Salcedo's interview, and what I will have to shout out our our, our brilliant editor Joanna. She um, she that was her task. <laughs> I got I got the people in the chair. I asked I asked their um, asked them questions, and I had conversations with them. And then Joanna kind of cut it all together and found these beautiful themes and mini arcs that they could tell in five minutes. Um, but there's a moment where we had heated debates, and there's a moment in Bambi Salcedo's interview, the trans Latina activist. Um, where she is discussing a very difficult time um, when she was incarcerated. And um, she, there's a moment where she kind of becomes overwhelmed with emotion and she does something in that moment. And we had a lot of arguments around, should we do it this way? This has never been done before. Do we keep it in? Do we not keep it in? I don't want to give it away, but people will understand when you watch Bambi's, um, Bambi's um, story in the film, her testimony, you kind of see why we kind of struggled with it, but it turned out to be one of, I think, one of my favorite moments in the film. Janet, when can people see the film? December 5th on HBO. It's really beautiful. Congratulations. Thanks Thank so much you. for being here and sharing the work with us. Thank you, Janet. Janet Mock, everybody.